All right, I guess we could start it. So there's having a little bit of technical difficulty in the video from last time hasn't been posted yet. Uh, I'll send out an email once that gets up. Um, if you're not registered for this class, you might want to send me your email address so I can get in touch with you for these sorts of things. Okay, so today um, is going to be about elliptic curves. And I want to start just by reviewing uh, some facts about algebraic curves that we'll need. Uh, so for the whole lecture today, K is going to denote a field. And curve is going to mean projected and smooth, unless I say otherwise. OK, so the, the first thing I want to talk about is divisors. So suppose that uh, C is a curve over our base field. So a divisor on C is just a formal sum of points. So summed over the points of C, uh, some integer coefficient, and then I'll, I'll write it like this to denote that it's a formal sum. Uh, so here, nx, this coefficient is in Z, and uh, the sum is supposed to be finite. So all the nx but a finite number is 0. So there's uh, a notion of, the, of a degree of a divisor. And so start by defining the degree of a point. So for a, a point in C, uh, its degree is just defined to be the degree of the extension of its residue field over the base field. And then if we have a divisor uh, D, you just define its degree by extending this linearly. So the degree of D is the sum of the nx times the degree of x. And so the set of all divisors forms a group, a Bielian group, just by adding coefficients formally. Uh, so that's denoted div x. This is the group of all divisors. And this degree map is a homomorphism from this to z. And the kernel is called div 0, the group of divisors of degree 0. OK, so there are some important divisors, um, the principal divisors. So suppose that we have uh, a function on C, which is not 0. Uh, so I'll write this for the function field of C. So f is a non-zero function on C. Uh, then you can define the divisor of f uh, as the sum over all points of C of the valuation of f at this point times the point. So that valuation is the order of the zero or the pole of f at that point. So f only has finite many zeros or poles, so this sum is finite, because if you don't have a zero or pole, the valuation is zero. Uh, poles have negative valuations, zero have, zeros have positive valuation. Uh, so a, a divisor of the form div f is called a principal divisor. And I'll, I'll write p div x with a set of them, which is a subgroup. Uh, so a very important uh, theorem, which I'm not going to prove, but you should try and prove yourself or look up the proof if you're not familiar with it, is that principal divisors have degree 0. So what this theorem really means, kind of in words, is that the number of zeros of f is equal to the number of poles of f. Uh, where by number here, I mean you count with multiplicity in the appropriate way. So we have this group of divisors and the subgroup of principal divisors. The quotient is called the class group. Class group of C is the group of divisors, not the principal divisors. And since by this theorem, principal divisors have degree 0, oh, I was writing x here and c there. Whoops. 
Okay, I'll stick with C for now. Uh, since principal divisors have degree zero, the degree homomorphism factors of the class group, and you can define uh, the subgroup of degree zero classes. So there's a, the divisors have um, functoriality in each way. So suppose they have a map of curves. So now I will use x and y. So if we have a divisor on x, then you can push it forward to divisor on y. And this is done in the obvious way. So f lower star of b is by definition the sum of nx. And then applied to f max. And if you have a divisor on y, so I'll write that as the sum of, say, ny times y. This is summed over the points of y. Then there's a pullback divisor on x. And uh, the way it's defined is um, as follows. So again, you sum over the points of y, and then you sum over the uh, pre-images of them. And then you're going to weight by the ramification index. So e of x over y, this is the ramification of x over y, and then just times uh, n y x. So basically, if you think of you know, x lying over y, you have these some points in the support of the divisor downstairs. You're just taking the entire fiber above that and just weighting it in a certain way by ramification. And because of this way of weighting it, if you pull back and push forward, it's just multiplication by the degree. That's sort of why you put these ramification indices in. So f lower star of f upper star d is just the degree of f times d. Okay, so now uh, the Riemann Rock theorem. This is one of the most important theorems about algebraic curves. Uh, so suppose that D is a divisor on our curve X. So I'm going to define a space of functions uh, called L of D. And it's the set of uh, functions on the curve such that the divisor of the function is greater than or equal to negative d. And uh, to compare two divisors by, by this, you just do it coefficient-wise. This means every coefficient of div f is greater than every co coefficient of d. Uh, and so uh, I didn't define the degree of the, uh, I didn't define the divisor of the zero function, but zero is in here just kind of by fiat. And you can show that this is a, um, it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. So this is actually a k-vector space. Uh, so if you haven't seen this before, it can be a little confusing to think about, especially with that minus sign in there. So um, a good example to keep in mind is if you take a point of, of x and you consider just uh, the divisor, just x, that single point. Uh, this is the space of functions that has, at worst, the simple pole at x and is holomorphic everywhere else. And so uh, uh, a simple fact, but one that's important, is that um, L of d is 0 if the degree of d is negative. And that's just because the degree of functions uh, is 0. The degree of the framework function is 0. Uh, and I'll write lowercase L of d for the dimension of this vector space. <coughs> it's not actually hard to show that it's finite dimensional, so this is uh, an integer.
So now that we have all these definitions, I can state the theorem, the reason rock theorem. And it says the following. Uh, this dimension L of D minus the dimension of L K minus D, which I'll define in a second, uh, is equal to uh, the degree of D um, minus the genus plus one. So here, uh, G is the genus of our curve. And uh, K is the so-called canonical divisor on X. So you can define that as the divisor of a non-zero meromorphic differential. And the important thing about it, uh, we don't actually need to know so much about it, but the one thing that is important that we need to know is that it's degree. The degree of the canonical divisor is 2G minus 2. Uh, so a corollary, uh, if the degree of D is greater than 2G minus 2, so in that case, uh, K minus D has negative degree, and so that L is 0, and so this theorem exactly computes L of D. It says that L of D is the degree of D minus G plus 1. And so in the special case that G is 1, which is going to be the uh, case of interest for us, this statement just says that if the degree of D is positive, then L of D is just equal to the degree of D. So that's actually the only form of Riemann rock that we're going to need today. And the last general thing about curves that I want to discuss is separability. Uh, so again, let's start with a map of curves, <coughs> x to y. So corresponding to this, if you look at the uh, function fields of these things, there's um, the function field of x is an extension of the function field of y. And by general field theory, there's a, a maximal intermediate extension, k, with the property that um, the, this extension here is a separable field extension, and this extension here is totally inseparable. And if you translate that back to geometry, it means that you can factor F, uh, our, our map F as follows, where this first map here is a totally inseparable map. And this map here is separable. And this lets you define what's called the separable degree of f and the inseparable degree of f. is just the degree of these two maps. So the basic example of an inseparable map is the Frobenius map in characteristic P. So let me recall that. So, so let's suppose that our curve x is defined by an equation f of x, y equals 0, where f is a polynomial coefficients in k. And, and I want to assume here that the characteristic of k is k. So I'm going to define uh, a, a new polynomial, which is called um, f and superscript p like this. And this is defined just by raising all the coefficients of f to the pth power. And I'll let um, x superscript p be the curve defined by that equation. So if we if we have a, an actual point x y on our original curve x, so something that satisfies this equation. If you raise this equation to the pth power, of course, it's still 0. But now, since we're in characteristic p, raising to the pth power is a ring homomorphism. And so if you raise this to the pth power, 
you're going to raise the x's and y's to the p power and all the coefficients to the p power. So f of xy to the p is x equal to this fp evaluated on xp, yp. And so this thing is equal to zero. So that means that if you send a point xy on x to x to the p, y to the p, that this will belong to xp. So this, this formula here actually defines a map of curves like this. And this is called the Frobenius map. And it is completely inseparable, totally inseparable. And you can do this um, with powers of p as well. So if q is a power of p, then fq is just uh, the rth iterate. If q is the rth power of p, then fq is the rth iterate of fp. And so that goes between x and something that you would call xq. So in fact, these are basically the only examples of inseparable maps. And this factorization can be improved. So if you have any map x to y, you can factor it first as one of these uh, fqs, and then a separable map. And this q here is just the uh, degree of inseparability of f. So in particular, in, in characteristic zero, there are, everything is separable. OK, so that's, that's all the kind of general curve stuff I want to do. Now I want to move on to elliptic curves. And so, I, oh, I should have said at the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do many proofs today. Uh, a good reference is Silverman's book. Uh, his, his first one, the arithmetic of elliptic curves. So everything that I'm going to say today is proved somewhere in that book. It's easy to find. Okay, so elliptic curves now. So the definition, an elliptic curve is actually a pair, E comma zero, where E is a genus one curve. And zero is just the k point of E. So in the future, I'll just write E for an elliptic curve. Zero will be implied. So the first thing to say about them, I think, is that they're groups. So there's a group law on the elliptic curve. So one way to see this is you can define a map from the set of k points of E to the uh, zero part of the class group of E by sending a k point x to the divisor, which is x minus this special point zero. And in fact, this map is a, a bijection. briefly show how to see surjectivity, which is the important part. So suppose that uh, you have a degree zero divisor. Then uh, if you add the divisor of zero to it, this is going to have degree one, of course. And so the Riemann-Roch theorem says that this space is one dimension. And so that means that we can pick some non-zero element of this space. And so if you think about the divisor of f, it has degree zero, and it's greater than or equal to the negative of this thing. And that divisor is degree one. And from that, you can see that the divisor of f 
has to be equal to minus d minus zero, just plus some other point. And so since the divisor of f is zero in the class group by definition, this shows you that d is equal to x minus zero in the class group. And obviously you need to prove subjectivity. And I'll leave it to you to prove injectivity. Okay, so you have this bijection from the k points of E to the class group of E. And the class group of E is a group, and so you can transfer that to the other side. So transfer of structure implies that E of k is a group. It's naturally a group. And in fact, uh, the group law on E of k is uh, induced by an algebraic group law on E. So there's actually a, a, a multiplication map, so a map of varieties from E times E to E, which induces the group law. And you can prove that sort of by a similar but more sophisticated argument. Are there any questions? All right, the next thing uh, to talk about is the equations for an elliptic curve. So this is a, a nice application of Riemann rock. So if, if we look at um, this divisor zero, the divisor of the origin, that obviously has degree one. And so Riemann rock says that this space is one dimensional. And now inside of the actual space, the script L is zero. Uh, so these are functions on E, which have at worst a simple pole at the origin and are holomorphic everywhere else. And there's an obvious function in there, the, the constant function. So this contains the constant function one. And since it's one dimensional, the constant function spans the space. So L of zero just consists of the constant functions. OK, so it, it, we can keep going. We can look at L of two times zero, and riemann roch says that that has degree two. So the space is two-dimensional. One is still in there, and so there must be some other function, and we'll call that function x. So L of two times zero contains one and this new function x. And then a similar thing happens when we go to three. So L of three times zero is 30. And so we get a new function, and we'll call that y. So 1x and y. And uh, you keep going. So uh, L of 4 times 0 is 4. And so there's a new function. But it, it's actually not new. We know what it is. Uh, x squared is already in here. And so that's what the new function is. It's not actually something new. So this has 1x, y, and x squared. And similarly, if you go up to 5, so there's another function, but uh, we know what that is already as well, and that's x times y. So 1x, y, x squared, and x times y. Okay, and now here's the payoff when we go up to six. So the space is six dimensional. And again, we know what the new function is, but there's actually two new functions that we can find, x cubed and y squared. So this space contains the functions one, x, y, x squared, x, y, uh, x cubed, and y squared. And there are seven functions here. If the space is six-dimensional. So there's a linear, a linear dependence among them. So we can write that as um, 
let's say, a1 y squared plus a2 x cubed plus a3 xy plus a4 x squared plus a5y plus a6x plus a7 equals 0. We get some linear, linear dependence like that. And so this equation here defines a plane curve. So uh, let's just call that E prime for the moment. So let E prime be the curve defined by this equation. So since these functions x and y satisfy this algebraic equation, that implies that they give a map from E to E prime. So x, y defines a map of curves from E to E prime. And in fact, this is an isomorphism. The proposition is that this is an isomorphism. And so in particular, that means that uh, our curve E that we started with, which we just defined as a genus 1 curve with a point, actually has a, an equation of this form. And so now I'm going to assume that the characteristic of our base field is not 2 or 3. So a lot of what I say will still be, a lot of the abstract statements I'll say will still be true, but they'll be a little harder. So with this assumption, you can make some changes of variables to this equation to make it nicer. Uh, like if you change, you know, here you have, so you can divide through, say, and get rid of the coefficient of y squared, and then if you change y to, you know, y minus half a3x, that'll get rid of this term. You need to be able to divide by 2 to be able to do that. And you can continue to play these games and get the equation to a simpler and simpler form. And you can reduce it down to, so you can, uh, so using this, you can make a change of variables get to an equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So that's a simple algebra exercise. And I'll call this equation here E sub a b. So we've just shown that every elliptic curve under the assumption that the characteristic is not 2 or 3 is isomorphic to one of these EABs. Now, there are isomorphisms between different EABs, and they're easy to see. Uh, if you let y, if you make a change of variables, set y equal to u to the minus 3 times y1, and set x equal to the u minus 2 x1, where u is some non zero element of the base field. So if you plug in these substitutions for x and y, You'll get a u to the minus 6 here, and a u to the minus 6 here, and then you can clear them. And you'll end up with a u to the fourth in front of this a, and a u to the sixth in front of that b. So this change of variable shows that e a b is isomorphic to e u to the 4a, u to the 6b, for any u in k star. Uh, but in fact, these are the only isomorphisms between the different e a b's. So every elliptic curve is of this form. Uh, you can ask the sort of converse question, is every curve of this form an elliptic curve? And the answer is yes, so long as this thing is non-singular. And for it to be non-singular, it, it's uh, necessary and sufficient that the roots of the right side here are distinct. And to test if the roots of the polynomial are distinct, you look at the discriminant, and you want the discriminant to be non-zero. So the discriminant of this guy, which I'll call delta, um, well, there's some constants thrown in to make some things work out nicely, but it's uh, minus 16 times 4a cubed plus 27b squared. So this is called the discriminant of that equation. And so what I just said basically means that EAB is an elliptic curve if and only if this discriminant delta is not zero. And notice that the discriminant is homogeneous um, in the sense that if you make one of these changes of variables, 
it's going to, a unit of 12 is going to pull out of the discriminant. So all this that I just said, let's just describe the set of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So if you look at the set of isomorphism classes of E's defined over K, this discussion shows that this is in bijection with the set of pairs A, B, and K squared, such that this discriminant is not zero, modulo the equivalents A, B is equivalent to U to the 4A, U to the 6B. Okay, so none of these quantities that I've been defining using the A's and the B's and the delta are sort of well defined on the isomorphism classes of elliptic curves because you can change them by these U's. So it's sort of natural to try to build uh, out of A and B an invariant expression. And it's easy to do that because you have two things and one is scaling by a fourth power and one is scaling by a sixth power. So if you just build two polynomials that have the same degree and take the quotient, that will be invariant under these changes in U's. And the so the best way to do that is the J invariant. So J is defined so uh, to be the following expression. So again, there's some numbers that don't really matter too much. There's a minus 1728, and then it's 4A cubed over delta. So A cubed and delta both have degree 12. And furthermore, delta is non-zero. So this is never going to be infinity. So the, I guess the best way to think of it is that this quantity J is associated to this EAB. But because of its invariance, uh, the J of any two isomorphic EABs is the same. And that's why this is called the J invariant. It's actually an invariant of the isomorphism class. So this is an isomorphism invariant. And an important result is that uh, if k is algebraically closed, then two elliptic curves are isomorphic if and only if their j invariants are equal. So j is a number, it's an element of your field, and it's actually detecting the isomorphism class of your elliptic curve if you're over a closed field. If you're not over a closed field, this is no longer true have curves the same chain variant that are not isomorphic. Of course, they'll become isomorphic over the closure, but that's all you can say. And, and, and this theorem is actually not hard to prove from the way that I've defined things. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about elliptic curves and just one elliptic curve at a time. Now I'm going to talk about maps between elliptic curves. And so there's a special name for, for the maps that we want to consider. Um, an isogeny between the elliptic curves, say E1 and E2, is a map of curves, uh, a non-constant map of curves. with the property that it takes the origin to the origin. And uh, there's two simple examples of an isogeny, of isogenies. So first of all, um, since the curves are, are groups, you can multiply by natural numbers on them. And so there's this multiplication by n hat, if n is an integer. And this is an isogeny. So that's something you have to prove. You have to show that this is actually not constant, uh, but that's not too hard. And another example is Frobenius. So if you're in characteristic P, then Frobenius map FQ from E to this twist is an isogeny. These are examples. 
Uh, an important fact about isogenies is that they're always group homomorphisms. So they're only defined to preserve zero, but elliptic curves are rigid enough so that actually forces them to be a group homomorphism. So I'm going to write um, Han E1, E2 for the set of isogenies together with the zero map. And this is actually a group, uh, where the group law comes from addition on E2. And in fact, it's a finite rank-free group. So it's a finite free Z module. And when E1 equals E2, you write end instead of on. So end E is um, E E. In addition, and in addition to this being a group from the group law on the target E, it, it's a ring or multiplication of composition. So that's called the endomorphism ring if you look at the curve. Okay, so uh, there's a few basic facts about isogenies that I want to recall. So the first one is the following. So suppose that f is an isogeny from e1 to e2, uh, and let its separable degree be n, and its inseparable degree be m. So then um, the first fact is that if you take any k bar point in E2, so let's say that y is a, a point of E2 defined by a k bar, then its inverse image, uh, which is a subset of the k bar points of E1, has cardinality exactly n, a separable degree. The second point is that uh, if f of x is equal to y, so x is the point e1, y is the point e2, then the ramification index is the inseparable degree m. So in other words, uh, the behavior here, the cardinality of the fibers and the ramification index is completely independent of the point. It's just all determined by the separable and inseparable degrees. And that shouldn't be surprising because it's a group home. So every point should sort of look the same. So one thing to note from this is that uh, the map F, this isogeny, is unramified, all the ramification indices are one, if and only if it's a separable map. And so that's automatic and characteristic zero, because everything is separable. And when that happens, all the inverse images have the size that you'd expect, the actual degree of the map. So the, the second thing I need, uh, second basic fact about isogenies that I want to mention is a test for determining uh, separability. So suppose that you have an isogeny E1 to E2. And uh, let omega 1 and omega 2 be non zero uh, global differentials on these curves. Holomorphic differentials. So remember that the, the genus of a curve is the dimension of the space of global holomorphic differentials. Elliptic curves have genus 1, which means that there's a one dimensional space of them. So up to scaling, these things are unique. So um, a proposition, first of all, f is, insepar is separable if and only if the pullback of omega 2 is not 0.
Uh, the second part, you can define, so the pullback of omega 2 is a one form on E1, and therefore it's some multiple of omega 1. So we can write uh, f upper star of omega 2 as some constant that's called alpha of f times omega 1, where this alpha is in k. And then the statement that I want to make is that if you regard alpha as a map from HOM E1, E2 to the base field, that it's a homomorphism. So this statement is relating addition in this HOM space, which is defined using the addition law in E2, to addition of differential forms. And then the, the last part is if uh, E1 is equal to E2, and you take omega 1 equal to omega 2, then alpha uh, is actually a ring homomorphism. And a corollary of, of these things that I've said, if we look at the multiplication by n map, uh, so multiplication by n gives a copy of the integers what's inside the endomorphism ring. And so the image of one of those integers is just the image of that integer in the base field k. And so that's zero if and only if the characteristic of k divides the integer. So you see that the multiplication by n map is separable if and only if p doesn't divide n, p is the characteristic. Okay, so we'll come back to some implications of this fact later. Uh, now I need to go over the dual isogeny. So again, we'll start with an isogeny from E1 to E2. And then the statement, maybe I should make this a proposition, is that there exists a map the other way, which I'll call F-dual. It's called the dual isogeny. It goes from E2 to E1. And um, it satisfies the following property on K points. So uh, this map the other way, of course, induces a map on the, the set of points. And these sets of points, we've already seen, are isomorphic to these class groups. And we have a map here, which is the pullback map on divisors. So f up this stuff. And the statement is that this diagram commutes. So it exists a map like this such that this diagram commutes. If you just knew this for k itself, that might not tell you very much because the elliptic curve may not have many rational points, but I mean, this diagram actually commutes if you pass any extension of k. So in particular, it's true over k bar. And so that uniquely determines the dual isogeny in this condition. And so, again, if you take sort of a more sophisticated approach and you consider families of divisors and things like that, then you can use this to define the dual isogeny. And so two important properties of the dual isogeny that you can deduce from this diagram and the behavior of this F star map is that uh, first, if you do the dual isogeny followed by the original isogeny, or sorry, the other way around, this is just multiplication by the degree. And this just goes back to the fact that f lower star, f upper star is multiplication by the degree of the divisors. And the second fact is that the formation of the dual isogeny is additive. So using these facts, we can deduce 
um, something interesting about the degree of an SRG. So it's basically quadratic. So I'm going to, uh, for the moment, define uh, lambda to be the Hans between E1 and E2, which we know is a uh, finite free Z module. And now I'm going to define a pairing on lambda. It's going to take values in half integers. And the definition is as follows. Um, 2fg is just the degree of f plus g minus the degree of f minus the degree of g. So this process of turning a single function into a, vari into a two variable function is called polarization. And now if you use this property A above, in terms of computing the degree in terms of isogenies and dual isogenies, you can get an expression for this pairing. So this is f plus g dual times f plus g minus f dual f minus g dual g. And then since this dual thing is linear, you can expand out and uh, you'll get some cancellation. The f, f dual and the g g dual cancel this. And so what's left over is f dual g plus g dual f. And this expression is linear in f and g. So this shows that this pairing is bilinear, or maybe biadditive would be better to say. And so if we take this last expression and we plug in uh, f equals g, then here we get f, f dual plus f, f dual, which is twice the degree of f. I put a 2 on this other side. And so you see that f, f is the degree of f. And, th and this shows two things. First of all, the degree is positive. So that shows that this bilinear form is positive definite. So whenever I plug in the thing with itself, it's positive. So this implies that this is positive definite. And it also implies what I was saying about degree as a quadratic function. Degree is quadratic. So in particular, this implies that the degree of the multiplication by n map is n squared. Quadratic means that if you multiply by n, an n squared is going to pull out. So the degree of n is n squared times the degree of 1. And the degree of the identity map is obviously 1. This lets you compute the degree. Okay, are there any questions at this point? All right. So now I'll do the theory over the complex numbers. So here things become a little more explicit and easy to see. So I realize a lot of this is just kind of me listing a lot of results. Um, that's just going to be for the first lecture or two. I just want to go over this kind of basic stuff and get it out of the way. Then, then I'll do more proofs. OK, so over C. All right, so suppose we have a multi curve over C. Um, and for now, I'll, I'll identify E with its set of complex points. So uh, we can think of E as a Riemann surface of degree 1, Riemann surface of genus 1. So it's a torus. Like actually, it's a, an actual torus if you think about topological spaces. And so we can take its universal cover. And the universal cover of a torus is a plane. And in fact, if you take the universal cover of a complex manifold, it has a natural complex structure, and the group law carries through as well. So the universal cover is actually the complex plane as a complex group. So the universal cover is a map pi from C to E. It's a covering space map, and it's a group homomorphism, and it's complex analytic, everything that you'd want. 
And of course, the kernel of this map, the inverse image is zero. So that's the fiber of a, over a point in the universal cover. And that's pi 1 v, which is the same as h 1 v. Because it's a torus. And that's isomorphic to z squared, because that's what pi 1 of a torus is. And I'll call this lambda. So lambda is sitting inside C, and it's isomorphic to z squared. So it's a lattice inside C. But conversely, if you start with a lattice, Then you can form the quotient. This is the Riemann surface of genus 1. And Riemann's theory of Riemann surfaces tells you that this is an algebraic curve. And that's not you know, obvious. I mean, there's work that goes into that. To prove that, you actually have to construct neuromorphic functions on this quotient. If you think of what those are by composing the universal cover map, you can think of those as meromorphic functions on C, which are invariant under translation by lambda. So to actually prove that this is a, um, an algebraic curve, you have to construct doubly periodic functions in the complex numbers. And the standard way to do that is this fire stress P function, which I won't go into now, but you can read about. Uh, it's a very pretty theory. So anyway, all that implies that this, this E is in fact an algebraic curve, and it's genus 1, so it's an elliptic curve. This is an elliptic curve. So if you have an elliptic curve, you get a lattice so that it's C mod lambda. And if you have a lambda, you get an elliptic curve. So you can go back and forth. So suppose we have two elliptic curves, right? Then the C mod lambda 1 and C mod lambda 2. We'd like to interpret the maps between E1 and E2 in terms of these lattices. And that's easy to do. So you can show that the space of maps on E1, E2 is naturally in bijection with a set of complex numbers, alpha, which carry lambda 1 to lambda 2. So obviously, if you have such a complex number, then multiplication by alpha descends to a map between these things. It's obviously going to be holomorphic. And conversely, you can like, look at the tangent space at 0, I suppose, and get something like this. And so two things to note. First of all, uh, the map corresponding to alpha is an isogeny, if and only if alpha is non-zero. And the map corresponding to alpha is an isomorphism, if and only if you have equality here. Alpha lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. So in other words, if I take a lattice and I scale it by some complex number, then the two resulting with the curves are going to be isomorphic. And that's the only way that different lattices lead to the same of the curve. So you can say that isomorphism classes of elliptic curves are a natural bijection with lattices in C modulo scaling. Uh, scaling of lattices is sometimes called homothety, by the way. OK, so I want to apply this um, little fact over there about how to compute Homs to look at the endomorphism ring, because that's something important. So we have our elliptic curve E C mod lambda. So the endomorphisms of E, by that identification over there, it's a set of complex numbers alpha and C, such that alpha lambda is contained in lambda. OK, since we're allowed to scale our lattice, you can think of you know, two generators of the lattice. It's, the lattice looks like z squared, so there's two generators. And if you scale by the reciprocal of one of those generators, you'll get one as a generator of the lattice. So you may as well assume that lambda is spanned by one and some other complex number, tau. The only requirement on tau is that it not be a real number, so that you actually get something that spans c. So let's look at this requirement, alpha lambda is contained in lambda, in terms of uh, this presentation of lambda. 
Okay, so this will happen if and only if alpha times one is in lambda and alpha times tau is in lambda. So for alpha times one to be in lambda, that says that alpha is in lambda. So alpha and lambda means that alpha is a plus b tau, where a and b are integers. So if b is zero, it's not very interesting, because you're just saying that alpha is an integer, and obviously every integer is in the endomorphism ring. So let's just consider the case where b is not zero. b equals zero implies alpha is in z. So for now on, I'll say b is not zero. So we also have the condition that alpha times tau is in lambda. And so that means that alpha times tau you can write as c plus d tau, where c and d are integers. So now if you take this first expression, alpha is a plus b tau, and multiply it by tau, then on the left side you get alpha tau, and down here we have an expression for alpha tau. And so if you equate those two, you get a quadratic equation that tau satisfies. So together these imply that b tau squared, I'm multiplying this one by tau, plus a minus d tau minus c is zero. And so at least if you assume that b is not zero, this shows you that tau is an algebraic number because these things are integers, these coefficients. And in fact, it's a quadratic uh, number. And since we assumed it wasn't real, it's an imaginary quadratic number. So if b is not zero, you find that tau is imaginary quadratic. And uh, this first expression shows that alpha belongs to the number field that tau generates. And so if you have uh, an alpha which is not an integer, then it has to belong to a, an imaginary quadratic field. That's what this shows. And since we know that the endomorphism ring is a finite z-module, and it's contained in an imaginary quadratic field, it actually has to be in order in that field. So this discussion shows that the endomorphism ring of E is either uh, z or an order in an imaginary quadratic field. And the second case happens if and only if the lattice for E is contained in that field, if you normalize it so that it contains one. So this second case where you have a bigger endomorphism ring this is called the complex multiplication case. You say that E has CM if its endomorphism ring is bigger than Z. And so let me do an example, because this is very easy to actually visualize. So let's take the lattice that's spanned by 1 and the number i. So you should think of the complex plane like this. Uh, here is i, that's in our lattice. Here's 1, that's in our lattice. 0 is in our lattice. And so you're getting all these Gaussian integers. It's just this very simple square lattice. And of course, if you multiply by i, multiply by, by i on the complex numbers, it takes this lattice into itself. So multiplication by i on c preserves lambda. And so it, it defines a map of the quotient, which is the curve, and I'll call that map bracket i. So you get a map from e to e. And so this is an example of a, a map of elliptic curves, which is not multiplication by an integer. And it's also not Trebenius, because we're in characteristic zero. So this is a new example. And you can, this map is actually not hard to see in terms of equations. So this elliptic curve E can be described by a plain equation, um, y squared is x cubed plus x. And uh, with these um, variables, Multiplication by i is the map which ends x comma y to negative x comma i y. So you can just see that if I make that change of variables, the equation is still satisfied. So most elliptic curves don't have complex multiplication. So you should think of the typical case as being non cm
Okay, so now I want to go back to the general situation where we're over a few. We'll talk about the tape module. Tape module and the tape there. So let's say we have an elliptic curve of our field K, and uh, N is an integer which is co prime to the characteristic Q. So, well, based on stuff that I've said today, the multiplication by N map, so this condition implies that multiplication by N is separable. And we know multiplication by N has degree N squared. And so if you remember that one proposition that I put up on the board about isogenies that are separable, uh, the number of points in their inverse image is their degree. So that means that the n torsion of E has size n squared, because the n torsion is the inverse image of zero under the isogeny, which is multiplication by n. So this implies that, the, so I'll write, okay, so I use the notation E bracket n for the n torsion. Um, but I'm going to use that for the subscheme of E. The actual n torsion subschemes. This is the fiber product of zero with the isogeny multiplication by n. So uh, all this is saying that if I look at the k bar points of that scheme, that this has size n squared. So in other words, the n torsion subscheme is a subscheme of E, and it's, in this case, it's actually a reduced subscheme. So there's no actual scheme stuff going on; it's just a collection of points in that n squared of and this is true for every n co prime to p. So if you think about, um, say, if n is a prime number, then this is a, a commutative group of size n squared killed by the prime number n. And so it, there's no choice for it except z mod n z squared. And if you apply that to all the divisors of n in general, uh, you're forced to conclude that this group, E n k bar, is isomorphic to z mod n z squared. Oh, and one thing that I mentioned I meant to say in the complex case, which I'll just say here, is that if k equals c, and you think of e as uh, c mod a lattice, then the n torsion is actually just one over n times that lattice mod the lattice. So, like in the, this case where we have this this particular lattice, if I take this point here, so that's not in the lattice, but if I multiply it by two, I get i. So in the quotient, two times that point is zero. All right, so the tape module. So L here is a prime number different from T. The tape module is defined to be the inverse limit of the L to the n torsion, or really it's k bar points, where the maps are multiplication by L. This is called the tape module. So explicitly, a point of the tape, an element of the tape module you can think of as a sequence, say x0, x1, x2, so on and so forth, where x0 is 0 and L times xn is xn minus 1. So that says that L times x1 is 0, so x1 is L torsion, and x2 is going to be L squared torsion, and so on and so forth. So it's a compatible sequence of torsion points. And since we have this structure for what the L to the n torsion looks like, we can put that into this inverse limit, and you see that the tape module is actually z L squared. It's isomorphic to that. So if you look at the complex case where we had this expression for the torsion in terms of a lattice, in the complex case, this tape module is actually naturally the lattice itself tensor with ZL. So the lattice is like Z squared and the tape module is ZL squared. So they're not much different. 
So the tape module is the best substitute that you have for the lattice in a, in a general situation where you can't use analysis. So that's why it's very useful. I mean, you saw that thinking about an elliptic curve, a C model lattice is very useful. A lattice is good to have around. And the tape module is the best substitute you have in general. So, so actually, this tape module is the sort of first uh, atal, well, it's dual to the first atal cohomology group. And so the general theory of atal cohomology generalizes the tape module to different varieties and higher cohomology groups. Do these lectures go to the hour or until? Okay. Okay, so here's something uh, interesting that happens with the tape module that you don't see over the complex numbers, a way that it's different. If your field's not algebraically closed, if K is not algebraically closed, then these torsion points typically won't be defined over K, they'll be defined over some extension. And so the Galois group will move them around. So the absolute Galois group of K is going to act on the tape module of E. And in fact, you can regard this as a representation. You can write it a little differently. So rho is a homomorphism from GK to the automorphism group of the tape module, which is GL2 ZF. So associated to an elliptic curve, you get this two-dimensional Galois representation. This is a very important idea and a very useful way of looking at things. So I just wanted to say that for now. We'll come back to it and say a little more about it later. So this idea of doing the tape module, I mean, you don't really, you, this didn't have to be an elliptic curve. You could do this to any group if you wanted. Uh, one group in particular you could do it to is the multiplicative group GM. So let me just remind you, GM is uh, just the multiplicative group. It's P1 minus the points 0 and infinity. Uh, the k points of gm, or of any ring, is just the group of units of that ring. We can form the tape module of gm, just using the same definition. Uh, the n torsion in gm is the set of units whose nth power is 1, so it's the roots of unity. So, you know, if, if I take a prime that's different from the characteristic, the uh, lth roots of unity, there are l of them. And so, uh, you know, everything kind of looks the same, but there's no squares here. The n torsion is z mod n z. And so when I do this inverse limit, I just get one copy of zl. So this is isomorphic to zl. And the Galois group, again, acts on this. And so you can regard this action as a homomorphism about chi from the Galois group to gl1 of zl. ZL star. So this is a, a character. It's an abelian character of the Galois group. And this is called the cyclotomic character. It describes how the Galois group acts on roots of unity, which don't lie in the base field. And so a, there's a close relationship between the tape module and the cyclotomic character. And that comes from what's called the Vey pairing which I'll now tell you about. So I'll state this as a proposition. So there exists a map uh, called EN from the n-torsion of E to mu n. Uh, really, I mean the k-bar point, but I'll drop that notation for now. So EN takes two n-torsion points on E and produces a root of unity. And it has the following properties. It's going to have a number of properties. So I'll list a few. Uh, so first of all, it's bilinear. So that means that if I plug in, if x and y are two n torsion points, and I do e n of x plus y comma z, um, it just adds on the other side. U n you think of as usually written multiplicatively, not additively. So this is e n x z times e n y z. It's alternating. 
that means that E n of x x is zero, uh, which implies that E n of x y is minus E n of y x. Uh, it's non degenerate. So that means that uh, if E n of x y is zero for all y, then x is zero. It, it interacts with the Galois group in the way that you'd expect. So it's Galois equivariant, meaning that if sigma is some Galois automorphism, and you apply the stay pairing to the sigma conjugates of x and y, you just get sigma acting on this root of unity. And finally, it has some compatibility condition between the different ENs. So uh, if x is uh, an n times m torsion point, and y is an n torsion point, then either I can regard, I mean, if y is an n torsion point, then it's also an n m torsion point. And so I can do the n m pairing on x and y. And this is supposed to be equal to the n pairing on m times x. And so you can take this en, this pairing on the n-torsion, and do it on the l to the n-torsion, and then take the inverse limit over n and get something on the tape module. So the inverse limit of these e l to the n is a pairing from the tape module of e to the tape module of gn. And by the way, the tape module of GM is often written as ZL1. I'll probably fall into using that notation, just so you know. And that notation, the ZL part means that as a group it's ZL, and the 1 means that the, the Galois action is the, through the cyclotron character. So if you look at these properties, it's bilinear. This pairing is still bilinear. That means you can make it a group homomorphism if you make this a tensor product symbol instead of just a time symbol. And then the fact that it's alternating means that it actually goes through wedge 2 instead of the second tensor product. And then the other conditions actually mean that it's an isomorphism. So actually, um, the properties imply that the they pairing is an isomorphism from wedge 2 of the tape module of E to ZL1 of the tape module GM. Uh, or another way to say this, if you think back in terms of um, thinking about the tape module in terms of this Galois representation rho, two-dimensional Galois representation, this is just saying that, so equivalently, the determinant of that representation is the cyclotomic character. So I, I remember when I first learned about the Bay pairing, you know, you have all these properties and there's some construction of it. And, it's hard for me to put it into a context initially, but I think that the, a good way to think about it to remember what it really means is it's computing the determinant of the tape module. And so there's an additional property of the, the vape pairing that I need to talk about, and that's its compatibility with the dual isogeny. So, uh, I'll state this as a proposition. Suppose that we have a map from E1 to E2. And we have an, an n-torsion point on, in E1 and an n-torsion point on E2. Uh, and there's two things I can do. I can map x over by f and get an n-torsion point on E2, and then take the vape pairing there. Or I can map y back to E1 using the dual isogeny and get an n torsion point on E1 and take the vape pairing there. And of course, this proposition says that they're equal. So the dual isogeny, you could say, is adjoint uh, to the original thing under the vape pairing. 
And so a nice consequence of this uh, is the following. So I guess I'll also state as a proposition. Uh, for simplicity, I'll just do this for endomorphism so you could formulate it for general isogenies. If you have an isogeny like this, then its degree, the degree of f, is just the determinant of the map that f induces on the tape module. And here's the proof. Uh, this is formal. So suppose that you have some element x, let's say x and y in the tape module. Then uh, I can look at the pairing between them. Uh, I'm not in the n torsion, so I don't want to use the notation e sub n. So maybe I'll just write brackets like a normal pairing. So I can look at the, so this, these angle brackets, I really mean it's kind of the debate pairing, the interest in the debate pairing. So I can apply f to these two torsion points and compute the pairing. And since uh, this thing is bilinear and alternating, uh, that's just going to turn into the determinant of f. That's what the determinant is, right? It's the map induced on wedge 2. So this is just going to be the determinant of f times x, y. And if you like, this is the definition of the determinant. On the other hand, I can use this previous proposition and move this f to the other side with a dual. So this is f dual f on x paired with y. And f dual f is multiplication by the degree of f. And that pulls out by linearity. So this is equal to the degree of f times x, y. And since you can choose x and y so that the right-hand side is non-zero, you can cancel it. And this shows that the degree is equal to the determinant. So this is one you know, useful way that the tape module linearizes things. So I had planned to go over the theory over finite fields, but given that there's so little time, I think it's best to wait and do that next time. So next time I'll talk about ellipticals over finite fields and start talking about the viewing varieties over fields. Right, does anyone have any questions about anything we talked about today? <laughs>